Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Please be seated. Welcome to each one of you here this morning, and a special welcome to Lieutenant Colonel Chris Michaud and the officers and members of the Prince Edward Island Regiment who are joining us for worship today. It's always a pleasure to have all of you with us and to your families and friends as well. Thank you for being here with us. And to all those joining us online, we're glad that you have joined us for worship today as well. So if I can say a word, I brag about each of you. There are three loves in my life, my family, my church family, and my regimental family. And to have all of you here today is better than Christmas for me. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. It is an absolute delight to see each and every one of you. We, uh, we have new projectors and we're, we're having some <laughs> issues <laughs> as we get used to them. The one on this side is slightly off kilter today, so hopefully you'll be able to see the words properly. Otherwise, the hymn numbers are listed in the bulletin if you need to use the hymn book instead. But Hopefully it will all work. But as Tom said, it's a delight to have all of you here. We're so glad to be able to worship together. We gather this day to worship God and to offer God thanks for the blessing of our lives, for all that we enjoy, and for the freedom we have to come together for worship. As we think of the freedoms we enjoy each and every day, we also gather this day to give thanks for all those who have served our country in time of war, out of a sense of duty to God and in service to their country. They endured the horrors of war so that we could live in freedom. It's our duty to remember them, to honor their service and sacrifice, and to ensure they are never forgotten. We give thanks as well for all those who have served or continue to serve in our Canadian Armed Forces and for the difference they make each and every day. And so we gather to remember and to give thanks. Let us pray. Loving God, as we gather this morning, we come with gratitude for all those who served in time of war to bring peace to our country and to give us the freedoms we enjoy each and every day. We also give thanks for all those who continue to serve, whether in the military or as first responders in our community, to keep us all safe and to maintain peace. Loving God, we pray for the needs of all those gathered here and those watching online, that you will bless them in body, mind, or in spirit as they have need. We pray especially today for Frida Banks as she and her family mourn the sudden passing of her son Sterling this past week. Please comfort them, we pray. And we pray also for Ella Pound and her family as they mourn Jack's passing this past week and pray your comfort and peace will rest upon Ella. Lord, we also gather this day with gratitude for the sacrifice Jesus made for each one of us on the cross, a sacrifice that gives us freedom from sin and oppression and assures us of eternal life with you in the kingdom of heaven. As we take time this morning to remember and give thanks, we pray that we will bring honor to the courage and sacrifice of those who have served our country, and most of all, that what we say and do will bring honor to you, our Savior and our God. And as we begin our time of worship, we pray together using the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is, O oh God, our help in ages past.
studying a picture of him in his uniform. His hair is too short and his pants are too long. Papa, I ask him, why did you lie about your age? Well, he says, so many other boys were joining and I didn't want to be left behind. I couldn't wait to put on that uniform. As soon as I did, I felt as proud as a peacock. Proud as a peacock, I ask. Proud as that, he answers. He struts across the floor with his chest puffed out and his belly pulled in. He stops in front of the mirror and combs his hair and pats some shaving lotion on his cheeks. He smiles at his reflection, but beneath my papa's smile, I see the serious young man in the photograph. My papa crossed the ocean. The war was far away and he went on a long journey to get there. He said goodbye to his mom and dad and his sweetheart, Betty. He promised to write them letters every week. Papa, I ask him, weren't you lonely? Sometimes I was, he says, but so was everybody else. Besides, my best friend Stuart was with me. There was always something to see or do on the ship. Most of the time, we were as busy as beavers. Busy as beavers, I ask. Busy as that, he answers. He whistles through his teeth as he irons his collar. He tucks in his shirt tails and rubs the polish and cloth across his shoes until they shine like new. He reaches in the drawer for a pair of socks and I glimpse a bundle of letters tied with faded ribbon. He smiles as he touches it with his fingers. But beneath my papa's smile, I know he's missing Grandma Betty. My papa was a hero. There were guns and fire and smoke and he crawled on his belly through the noise and the mud and pulled three men to safety. The army gave him a special medal that he keeps in a leather case. Papa, I ask him, weren't you scared? When I was a lad, he says, I thought I wasn't afraid of anything. Then when something frightening did happen, I pretended to be as brave as a lion. Brave as a lion, I ask? Brave as that, he answers. I help him fasten his medal above the pocket of his blazer. Sometimes my papa's hand shakes, so he needs to borrow mine. He smiles as he gives me a poppy to pin on my jacket. He looks very proud, but beneath my papa's smile, I hear the bad dream that woke him in the night. My papa marches in the parade. The crowd cheers and claps as the veterans go by. Some are young, some are old, some sit in wheelchairs, and some walk past holding on to others. I stand at attention. The music stops, and there is a moment of silence. A cold wind sends dry leaves skittering past my feet. I am as quiet as a mouse, as quiet as that. My papa lays a wreath. He carefully places it at the base of the monument. Attached is a card that reads, in loving memory, Stuart David Adams, 1923 to 1944. My papa salutes, then he steps back and dabs his eyes with his handkerchief. He puts his hand over his heart. I do the same and I can almost touch the ache. Papa, I whisper, why are you crying? I am remembering, he says, a war is something you never forget. <laughs> elephants never forget, I tell him. Then let's be elephants, he says. Mm -hmm. A soft rain falls as a bugler trumpets his notes up into the cold gray sky. We link our hands and bow our heads. Isn't that a great story? And so 
So why are we, what are we celebrating tomorrow? What are we remem remembering tomorrow? What's it called? Remembrance. Remembrance Day, exactly. And so we all gather today because we are remembering all the service and sacrifice of all the people who went to war and all the people who continue to serve our country. And we want to show that we're thankful and grateful for all that we have and enjoy each and every day. And so we gather on Remembrance Day and we have the special service every year so that we can remember all the reasons we have to be thankful. And I was going to do this during the announcement time, but I'm thinking we should do it now while you're still here. I want you to turn around and look at the congregation, which has been around, and I'm going to ask all of the veterans, all of the current serving members of the Prince Edward Island Regiment or serving members from elsewhere and all first responders if they would please stand so that we can show our appreciation to them. over them and keep them safe keep them safe and please bless us please bless us and help us to always remember and help us to always remember in Jesus name we pray in Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. Great. Thank you all. I would like to invite the CEO and the Director of Music, Captain O'Donnell, if they would come forward, please. So this is a special day for a whole number of reasons, including the fact that we are going to consecrate the new regimental drums. And these are much more than wonderful musical instruments. You can see that they are emblazoned with the battle honors of the Prince Edward Island Regiment. And uh, like our Gidon, they are sacred elements in the regiment. And uh, so we want to set them apart and uh, ask divine blessing upon them in keeping with uh, military tradition in this country that goes back several hundred years and uh, in tribute to those who've gone ahead of us, to those who are serving now, and to those who will be serving in the future. Audrey, on behalf of the Prince Edward Island Regiment, we ask you to bid blessing on these drums. In the name of the one who is holy, we do consecrate and set apart these drums that they may be a sign of our duty toward our King and our country. Lord God, as we consecrate these drums today, we invoke your blessing upon them. We also ask for your favor to rest upon all members of the Prince Edward Island Regiment. May they who follow these drums be granted courage and wisdom, protection and honor, and be sustained through resiliency in body, mind, and soul. For these things we pray and ask in your name. Amen. Um, I'd just like to take a moment, um, if you haven't seen the drums up close, I invite you after the service to please come take a look uh, closer and see the, the amazing workmanship that's gone into these. These were hand painted in the UK by a company called Ammo & Co that uh, do these drums. And it was back in 2017 that we first uh, got the idea that we needed to have a new set of drums and we needed them to have our battle honours and our colours. And through the work of, of myself, our RQ Sergeant McKinnon 
our Band Sergeant Major, Warrant Officer Michael Lance, and our CO at the time, Lieutenant Colonel Moriarty. Uh, countless hours of work went into making these, and I think you'd all agree with me that they are absolutely beautiful, and I thank you, Padre, for taking the time to concentrate these. Awesome. Perfect. Well said. Thank you. Let us pray. Loving and merciful God, as we bow our heads in your presence, we admit that although you call us to be people of peace, we often fail to be peacemakers. We confess to you that so often we are caught up in ourselves, what we think, what we need, what we want, and it causes tension between us and divides us one from the other. We also confess to you that so often when faced with disagreements, we are more concerned with being right than with finding peaceful compromise and solutions. We pray you will forgive us, Lord. Remind us that peace comes first and foremost through our relationship with you and then our relationships with each other. Help each one of us to seek to be in unity despite our individual differences and to work together in your name so that we will make a difference for good in this world. Loving God, we pray too that you will help us to better appreciate the many blessings and freedoms we so often take for granted. The blessings of our families, our friends, our work, the peace we enjoy, and the freedom we have to gather together, even to gather here to worship you, things for which others fought and sacrificed so that we can have them. Help us to better appreciate the sacrifices that others have made on our behalf and for our sake. And help us to better appreciate our faith and the difference it makes to more fully appreciate the sacrifice Jesus made on our behalf and for our sake. And all these things we pray in and through his name. Amen. Hear the good news. The good news of the gospel is that Christ died so that we might live. Through his sacrifice, we have been forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you now to turn to page 548 in your pew Bible. For those of you in the front row, they're just under the seat there. There's a little shelf. Um, you may have to share. There might not be enough of the actual pew Bibles, but page 548. And we'll be reading Psalm 91 responsibly, and we invite Scott McDonald to lead us. Psalm 91. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, My refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a You will not fear the terror of the night or the arrow that flies by day. Or the pestilence that stalks in darkness, or the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the Most High your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, no sword come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against the stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Those who love me, I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. 
I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. for good as we reach out in your name to our community and to the world beyond so that all may hear the good news of you and your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Just a 
few announcements, um, especially for members of the church family that are revised November calendars, so please take one because some dates have changed for some of the upcoming events <coughs> for the month. So please take a revised calendar. It says revised at the top, so you'll know you have the right one. Our thanks to Peter Bevan Baker for being here once again for our annual remembrance service. Peter, it's always a blessing to have you with us. Thank you. And our thanks and appreciation to Lieutenant Colonel Chris Michaud and the officers and members of the Prince Edward Island Regiment, and to any who are here who formerly served in the Canadian Armed Forces, to our veterans, to all current serving members, first responders, to all of you, thank you for what you do for each one of us and the difference that you make. And as we think of one of our veterans, if you turn to the back of the bulletin, you'll see that today's bulletin is dedicated in loving memory of Reginald Lee, who was a veteran of the Second World War and a charter member here at St. Mark's and who is lovingly remembered by his children, Malcolm, Barclay, Paula, and Anne, and a donation has been made to St. Mark's in Reg's memory. Thank you. And you'll see a number of other announcements in the bulletin, including a movie night coming up, the Christmas bake sale, and the annual Christmas concert with Kendall Doherty and friends. So if you make note of those dates and mark them on your calendar. And now I would like to invite Lieutenant Colonel Michaud to come forward to read our scripture passage for today. A reading from John, chapter 15, verses 9 to 17. Jesus said, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends, because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. In a world where we can communicate with family and friends instantly, whether they are across the street or across the world, we can easily forget that during the First and Second World Wars, communication was dependent on newspapers, radio reports, and letters. <clears throat> Literally millions of letters were exchanged between those serving and their families at home. Care packages were sent with socks and home baking. Some contained precious photographs to remind the soldiers, sailors, and airmen of those who were keeping the home fires burning, eagerly awaiting their return. Letters were quite literally a lifeline between those serving and those at home, providing a window on the world in which each was living at the time. When it came to those letters, chaplains played an important role, one that is often overlooked. But we're going to hear from one of those chaplains as he tells us the story of letters home. He's Padre Alfred Seaman from Springfield, Prince Edward Island, serving with the 5th Field Regiment near Caen, France. He's at his desk in his tent preparing to fulfill one of his duties. And we'd like you to imagine this morning that you are a war correspondent. You've been told that a unit's military chaplain has a special understanding of what is important to soldiers. So you've come to talk to the Padre and ask him about his work. Oh, 
Good morning, and welcome to the 5th Field Regiment. I'm the military chaplain, Padre Alfred Seaman. I'm glad you've taken time to stop by. Good to meet you. Um, where do you hail from in Canada? Nova Scotia. Always a pleasure to meet a fellow Maritimer. I'm from Springfield, Prince Edward Island. Please, come on in. Let me make you a cup of tea. What's that, you ask? What does a military chaplain do? Well, we have lots of primary and secondary tasks, but so much of our work is summarized in the one word, morale. You see, morale affects everything that affects a soldier. So from equipment to training is all part of morale for a soldier, but there are deeper things that affect a soldier's morale. Things that people don't see, things that are on the inside, like a soldier's hopes and dreams, soldier's fear and anxieties, soldier's faith and prayer, and then one of the most important aspects of morale, the connection a soldier has with home. For centuries, chaplains have served as guardians of morale. In fact, we're the only ones that can go around the chain of command to the commanding officer if we see deficiencies in equipment or training, or we see something even more important. If we can be a lifeline between a soldier and God, and a lifeline between a soldier and home. <laughs> All of which brings me to the mail that you see in front of you. Uh, looks like I'm going to be here for a while. Part of my role as chaplain is to uh, censor mail soldiers sent home to ensure that it doesn't contain information that could jeopardize the safety of our position or the success of a present or future mission. And uh, it can be a tedious job, and I'm sure the families at home get frustrated when they get letters from their, their family members overseas that uh, have parts of it, the sentences that are cut out, or uh, the censor's pencil frequently blotting out other sentences. Now, these letters are a window into the hearts and minds of soldiers, and sometimes the content can be quite comical. For instance, uh, listen to this one. The Padre told us on Sunday that Dan and Beersheba were two places in the Holy Land. Gosh, he spoiled it. I always thought they were man and wife, sort of a romance like Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> <laughs> or the, uh, the other one handed me here by our CO who asked me to recommend a response. Dear Colonel, could you give any information about my husband? When we married in Birmingham three months ago, I was not well. Since then, I have had no money and have been in bed three weeks with a doctor <laughs> and am no better. I suspect that the wording wasn't quite the message she meant to convey, but I was able to have that soldier write home a letter to his wife. In many of the letters home, soldiers explain why they enlisted why they feel it's important to fight in this war. And this is what one soldier wrote. I believe that signing up was both a patriotic and prestigious choice, even though I didn't have any connection with the regiment. And another soldier said, my background, I suppose, is Scottish. I've always liked the Highland Regiment, so I joined up. I didn't know anyone in it, but I thought it was a pretty proud regiment. And for some soldiers, it gave them a job, and they wanted to join up with their friends. As one private noted, I joined up to escape the Depression. I was fed up with trying to get a job. Uh, here, Sergeant agreed, and this is what he wrote. Everyone was doing it. Well, almost everyone. We were the first to go. There were about six of us from my street who all decided to go. And we were going to meet at the corner in the morning, and two of us went. The rest had chickened out, so two of us went, and we went up to the unit, and they took us in. Most signed up in a unit, but some, for some, the recruiting process was somewhat chaotic, especially at the beginning of the war, as one soldier noted, the letter here, 
We thought we were in the Irish regiment, but they were up to full strength, so they had a truck waiting outside the armories. And they said, if you want to get to a kilted outfit, jump in the truck. And we didn't know even where we were going, but that's where we ended up. For many of us who have been separated from our families for years, it's the letters we get from them. It's the memories of home. It's, it's the memories of the last day with our families from home that stay with us. And I, I came across a letter earlier that described the last moment a soldier was leaving his hometown of Montreal. And he asked me to send it to his sister, and, uh, and here it is. It takes about 20 minutes to get out of Montreal, counting the different stations, and along the line, the people from the factories in nearby houses were all standing out to wave us goodbye and cheer us up. Lots were crying. One old lady handed me a big flag, which I certainly did fly and did cheer and say goodbye to some hundred people. When I would see a poor old woman crying, I would holler to her, Don't cry, mother, we're coming back. But God only knows which ones are coming. Gee, it was sad, but we could not afford to cry. It would only make the ones left behind feel worse. I think it's harder on those left behind than it is on those leaving, because we have too much to do and think about, that we are too busy to get lonesome. I felt very happy and hollered and sang with a bunch like a two-year-old till just losing sight of Montreal. I was standing there on the platform of our car and looked out and saw Mount Royal and said to myself, where will I ever see it again? It was then that I felt blue for a moment and almost cried. <laughs> and when I come across soldiers from PEI now and then, and they have similar stories to tell me about their last moments before they were either on the train or they were marching to the ferry at Wood Islands to leave. Life in France also means dealing with the ongoing illnesses like colds and flus. And sometimes soldiers get creative to keep going as one soldier wrote, Bleary flop from the flu. I will try a new remedy, aspirin and gin. <laughs> if I am alive tomorrow, we'll be able to discuss its merits. <laughs> Apparently, the concoction worked because the letter continues with, The remedy was so successful that I must repeat it tonight. <laughs> If it merits becomes more evident with use, we'll be superhuman shortly. <laughs> A chew, more flu, so more remedy. <laughs> there are also letters that describe danger at the front. Naturally, this includes combat against the enemy, but even trying to rescue the wounded <coughs> and the dead was dangerous. And I haven't censored this letter yet, but it certainly describes the danger that is ever present, and this is what one young officer wrote. A few days ago, I hit the dirt when I heard a jerry shell coming and managed to shove my nose into the ground where a jerry body had been lying. I, also, I almost lost my lunch, but it was better than losing something else. <clears throat> my real baptism of fire came when I went with some others to recover the bodies of three of our fellows who had been hit by mortar fire. We christened the corner Hellfire Corner. Hellfire Corner was near Con France. Censor, no locations. Jerry had it under observed mortar fire. When we got there, he had several vehicles pinned down and was dropping those mean airburst shells that go off just above our heads. I dove beside a fellow when we heard one coming. He got it in the head, a piece went through his helmet, but hadn't enough left to penetrate the skull. He also lost part of a finger, but was not knocked out. Why I escaped is one of the great mysteries of war. I only had on my cap. I decided it was time to move fast. Shortly after, I ducked and felt a ping on my rear end and figured I would have something to show for my war effort. But the piece of shrapnel that hit on the lapel of my back pocket and didn't have enough force left to penetrate the skin. 
That night, I uttered prayers of thanksgiving in hopes that I would be worthy of survival. I was plenty scared, as were all the rest. Make no mistake. Despite their resolve, despite their courage, despite their commitment, soldiers are scared. I know this because of my ongoing conversations with them. Having a lifeline with one's home and with one's comrade is absolutely vital. But there's another lifeline that is also very important for soldiers. And I've just received a letter from a fellow chaplain who is a close friend. And this is what he wrote. After lunch, I had a voluntary service by the roadside. 100 men participated, and even the traffic of tanks on the road failed to interfere. I wish that I could always have his interest in a congregation. I invited, invited any who desired to enter a nearby house for communion service. I expected about a dozen, but over 40 lads came and crowded the small room. A few wanted New Testaments. I had only six with me, and they were grabbed very quickly. I chatted a while after the service, and as I came away, I noticed one lad sitting by the road reading the New Testament I had given him. Believe me, religion is not merely respected, it is actually practiced in this front line. There is no time to talk about petty themes in services here. In addition to censoring the mail, I write letters to next of kin. And some of those are extremely difficult to write. This is a letter that I've just written to a mother of a young soldier who was killed. Mrs. Smith, there is very little I can say to you at, these, at this time. Your husband was a brave man and his loss is being felt by all ranks, although I know that to you the loss is irreparable. It is something to know that he met death bravely in the performance of a hazardous duty and his efforts were not in vain. We buried him, and his grave has been marked with a cross. In the midst of your grief, may you take comfort from your faith in God, and may you know the peace that passes all understanding. Be assured that you and your family are held in my ongoing prayers. May God bless you. And then there is the sad task of forwarding a soldier's letter home to his family. Like this one, as you'll hear, and this is from an islander, he was prepared for the possibility of not returning home, and this was his just-in-case letter. Unfortunately, now I have to send it to his family. By the time you receive this, I'll have arrived at last at the end of the trail. I know it will be a great comfort to you to know that I was well prepared to face our Lord and that even as you read this, I will be close by in spirit praying for you all. Knowing this, I'm sure you won't feel too badly about it all as the best any person could wish another is that they arrive safely in heaven. I realize I've been more or less of a great worry to you most of the time between slackness and study and sickness and I want to thank you all for being so patient with my faults and drawbacks during our time together. I realize also that it was a great sacrifice for you to finance my way through school, <clears throat> shoulder my hospital bills, and I've always intended and hoped to be able at some time to pay you back, but it was just not to be so. At any rate, I want you to know that I've always appreciated it and always felt deeply grateful despite the fact that I may not have seemed so at times. I thank God for the really great privilege of being able to give my life as an aid, small though it may be, in overthrowing one who would destroy religion, freedom, and all that's worth living for. I also thank God for the really great privilege of having had such a brother and sisters as you. Not everyone is so fortunate. I'll be up here with Papa and Mama, watching and waiting for you, and praying for your success and happiness until that day when we shall all be once again reunited. May God bless you all with much love. Speaking of letters home, it's time that I wrote a letter to my beloved Louise and my daughter Lorna and my son Andrew. 
They carry their picture with me wherever I go. Andrew was just a baby when I left, and Lorna was just a wee girl. Andrew is walking and talking now, and it seems like forever since I was home on PEI. How I miss the red soil. How I miss the lupins in the spring. And I think about my last day with my wife and my son and daughter. And like so many soldiers over here, I think over and over and over and over again what it will be like those first few hours, that, that first day when I'm home. I think about holding my beloved wife for the first time in years and how incredible that is going to feel. I think about hugs with my son and daughter. I, I can see in my mind's eye my daughter around the kitchen table and my parents' farm and, and mom teaching my daughter how to cook. And, and I see my son in the barn with my dad as he teaches Andrew his, son, his skills as a farmer. And then at night when I'm the loneliest, I see myself holding hands with my beloved Louise and walking on our favorite beach on the North Shore. And I think about that over and over and over again. And what keeps us going is our families back home, is our faith, is our resolve, and we are doing what needs to be done to make the world a better place and dreaming, dreaming about that day when I will hold the people most closely and never leave them ever again. So, I've got a letter I need to start. Here's their picture. Dearest Louise, I am missing you so much today. How are Lorna and Andrew? In July 1944, during the Battle of Khan, Padre Alfred Seaman, chaplain to the 5th Field Regiment, served alongside the medical officer at the regimental aid post. Under battle, he retrieved wounded soldiers and transported them back to the aid post for treatment. On 14 July, during a rescue mission, Padre Seaman was hit by enemy shrapnel. Tragically, he died of his wounds on July 21st, on what was his and Louise's 10th wedding anniversary. At home on Prince Edward Island, Louise received the dreaded telegram informing her of her husband's death and Lorna and Andrew grieved a father who would never return home. During the Second World War, Canadian chaplains were mandated to serve the spiritual and moral welfare of the men, and often that work was routine, providing counseling to the soldiers, censoring letters, conducting worship services. But other times, like Padre Seaman, their role put them in great peril. And Lisa, would you please put up the photo of Padre Seaman and Louise and Lorna and Andrew. <coughs> there they are, and that is the photo that he always kept in his tunic pocket. And also we have a photo of his tombstone in France. Over the decades, the memory of Padre Seaman, like countless others who paid the ultimate sacrifice, has been largely forgotten or overlooked by their, except by their own families, which is why it's so important for us to continue to observe Remembrance Day, to hear their stories, stories of everyday people like each one of us, who despite the fact that they lived ordinary lives, signed up and did extraordinary things so that we could enjoy the life and freedoms we have today. And so we recommit ourselves to preserving their stories and their legacy, and we promise that we will remember them. Amen.
our national anthem, we ask you to remain standing for the duration of our act of remembrance, which will end with the laying of the memorial wreath and the royal anthem. <clears throat> Thank you. 
They shall not grow old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them. Let us pray. Almighty God, we remember and give thanks this day all those who have willingly served our country. We give thanks for the sacrifices they made so that we might live in freedom. And we thank you too for those who continue to serve to preserve our freedoms. Please watch over and protect them, we ask. Lord, we live in a selfish and self-serving world where people are focused on themselves and their own personal gain. But Remembrance Day reminds us of those who have done the opposite. And so today we give thanks for all those who gave their lives in service to our country. We think of Padre Alfred Seaman and all of the fallen. Please help us to preserve their memory and to work diligently to maintain the peace that they sacrificed their lives for. And most of all, may we never forget the debt we owe to those who gave of themselves for our sake. May the memory of their service and devotion inspire each one of us to live our lives in ways that serve and bless others. And we pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who willingly gave himself as a sacrifice for each one of us so that we might have life here and for eternity. Amen.
Let us pray. The Lord bless you and keep you. And the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you to fill you with his peace this day and forevermore. Amen. Mm -hmm.